over the years, y'all have watched me do a lot of hand tool woodworking, obviously, and I've kind of come down to using three main uh, bench planes over all that time. I have my jack plane, I have a block plane, and then I have this wooden hand plane, which I use as a smoother and a generalist. One of these three is not like the other. Can you guess which one? It's this one. This jack plane, which is a bevel up hand plane, but for this purpose, it operates a lot of the same. You have a handle on it, and the handle is actually pushing almost behind the blade. So you're pushing forward. I love this plane for, you know, like straightening out joints uh, on the side, jointing stuff. Roughing work where I'm really getting down. See, my elbow drops down behind it when I'm using it to drive this motion forward like a locomotive. I'm pushing forward on that one. These two I use mainly on top. It's why I put this knob on my block plane. Because I make so many small projects, this just becomes a great smoother for like, you know, boxes about this size. I just want to smooth out a small board. I got the most minutest of camber on this plane and I can push down on top to really get a nice smooth cut. You know, if I'm doing cabinets and stuff like that, I come back to this one as my main smoother. But for small things, that knob really makes it work up fine. But of these three, people sometimes get confused because I've got a wood one intermixed in the middle. And in our craft, a lot of times people either gravitate towards all metal or all wood because they're slightly different. The reason why my main smoother for big projects where people will actually notice stuff is wood is in my use and how I've got mine set up, I just think it works better as a smoother. But how could that be? Because we all know wooden hand planes require more maintenance, right? And smoothing planes are the absolute most finicky planes we use. I mean, a jointer, you don't, you tune it so it's flat, but you know, you're not really having to worry about tear out and all that kind of stuff. That's what the smoother does. You know, all your other planes, there's a, there's a little laxness to it, but smoother, you know, there's no forgiveness. So why would I prefer a wood one? Especially when they have the reputation that you're constantly having to tune them. They had that reputation for constantly needing to be tuned. It's because they're made out of wood. Wood moves. It changes with the humidity in the air. Uh, the thing is, though, in practice, what I have found, and I've made many planes. I did a whole production run of them a while ago. Uh, my first one was the first class I took. And that's this one right here. And then I've got several ver versions up there. And I made this one about 13 years ago. And the whole reason why I uh, came up with this video idea is because on Facebook, this thing popped up 13 years ago, you finished this thing up. So anyways, uh, well, from my experience, what happens is you will make it and you'll get it all tuned perfectly. And then about a few weeks later, you're probably going to have to reflatten the bottom. And then probably a month later, you'll have to reflatten the bottom. And then for a year or so, you'll, feel, you'll just kind of think, well, every season I'm going to need to reflatten the bottom. And then you'll go a few seasons where you haven't done it, it's still working fine. You know, well, maybe it's been a year. So you have to reflatten the bottom. And then, you know, six years go by and I can kind of document the last time I tuned this one up via videos. So it's one of those things that it requires a little bit in the beginning as the wood gets a, accustomed to its current shape. But if you've got the t shaping right where you're exposing lots of end grain all over the place, it's going to kind of eventually settle. And when it settles, it's about the time you kind of develop a relationship with it. So adjustments become really quick and easy. Now, I'm not saying that it takes that long that you have to dedicate to a single plane. Uh, generally, I found that in about a week, most of the students I were teaching, they kind of preferred this style just because it's a little bit more guttural. You tune it by, you, you adjust it by banging it, that kind of stuff. But tuning it as a smoothing plane 
There are some things you can do with a wood body plane that you just can't do with a metal one. So today I figured I will tune this up even though it doesn't really need it and I'll show you some of those idiosyncrasies that you can work into it. First off, you're going to need to get a very flat reference. I'm using one of these engineering marbles that are you can buy that are kind of registered that way. I like them because they stay flat and they aren't that much money and these are a lifetime investment. So if you're doing a lot of plain blade flattening, all that kind of stuff, anything where you need a super flat reference, these make a great option. Now you could just use, you know, your table saw top or something like that because all that's good enough for woodworking. This just takes it to the extreme level. You're going to want to tape down some uh, uh, sandpaper. You know, it, it can be, you know, 220, 320. I got 400 here just because I know this is already pretty flat and I don't need to do too much. You don't have to have a super smooth finish for this to work because you're going to be damaging it as you go over rougher boards because they just kind of scratch it up over time. Uh, but that's just what it is. Now, next up, I'm going to loosen my blade and then reinstall it. Now, normally when I install these, I install it so it's perfectly flush with the ground and then come back up. This time I'm going to lift it up about a millimeter, not too much, just a little bit, and then reinstall the, the wedge. If you lift it up too much, it's married to the bed when you make these things, so this might not be perfectly flat, but it is matched to this right here. And we'll show you how to adjust that later on. But the normal action of tightening and using your plane blade, this squeezes over here. So it actually puts a little bit of pressure right there. So that tension kind of locks the base into a shape. It's, you know, pushing down either for So it has to be tensioned in order to flatten. Next up, I'm going to mark pencil the base. Now, here's the thing. A plane only has to be in plane right here, right here, and right here. All this other is superfluous. So I'm going to go ahead and pencil mark all this. So if I get all the pencil mark off, I know it's all in one plane. But here's the thing. In order to get that flat, I only have an eight inch, uh, piece of sandpaper right here. If I come over here and I put my plane here and I push off this way, the back of my plane blade gets all 11 inches of sanding done, but the front only gets about eight. So you actually have to kind of make sure that every area of your plane gets about the same. So a lot of times I will start like right here and you're going to see me only go a little bit to flatten it. Just like that. Also notice I'm working my way across the sandpaper. Because if you sit here and just go back and forth in one area, invariably these two sides are going to get sanded back more than the center because they're getting exposed to fresh edges as you kind of just move back and forth a little bit where sandpaper is gumming up on the inside, pushing the center back. Now let's take a look. Over those first few passes, I've touched here, I've touched here, and not so much back there. So keep at it until all the pencil marks are gone. And yes, I am putting pressure down. Also, I'm putting pressure down in the way I normally use it. My wrist is on this side. As you can see, my sweat marks are here, but not over here. And this hand is over on this corner. As you can see, sweat marks are on here, over here. That's just how I use it, which is also how I stress the wood in use. Now on mine, you might notice the sandpaper is gumming up a little bit because I wax the bottom. So right now we're taking off the wax. It's mixing with the sawdust. So I need to go ahead and replace the sandpaper to get the best results. But actually with that right there, 
I'm pretty much happy. I've got sand marks all the way down. I'm just going to keep going until I get it all though. Okay, so I now have pretty much completely flattened all this area right here. It's got the same scratch marks, but my edges are very, very sharp. So this is actually something you need to do when you flatten your metal planes, your metal smoothers. And yes, even the number four Stanley, every now and then you need to flatten that bottom and that creates a very sharp edge. Well, not only do you not want that to cut high spots, but you actually kind of want it to ride a little bit over. So we're gonna take that about 45 I'm just going to give you a few swipes. And then, same for the front. My front's got a little curve to it, so I have to do that special. And there we go. You just want it to be able to slide a little bit over those undulations and not chip off. I'm going to take my corners off too, just so they're not so sharp. So with that done, we're going to now tune in something you can't do with a metal plane. Well, at least not very easily. Now remember, all we're concerned with is the toe, the mouth, and the heel being in plane, right? Well, here's something I kind of learned that Japanese planes do occasionally, that when I first tried it, you really notice a difference. This area right here, okay, here and here doesn't have to be in plane. So I'm actually going to scrape a, the slightest of hollow right there. Flex your card scraper quite a bit and then we're just going to start in the middle and kind of work our way until we get a nice hollow. A little bit weighted towards that side, so I'm going to concentrate a little bit more over here. And that is now shallow enough that as I run my finger over it, I can actually feel it. It's probably only a millimeter or two deep right there and right there but it is noticeable. So back to the sandpaper and in a few swipes, I should be able to remove these pencil marks because it's already flat. I just want to make sure it stayed flat when I'd hauled out a little bit of material. Pencil marks gone. Next up, I am going to Make sure that the plain blade is, per, is, is properly bedded. So go ahead and take your blade out. You're going to want to clean the sole of your plain blade. You can see I've had some sawdust that has compressed in there a little bit time, over time. So I just want to make sure it is, everything's removed there. And I like using a little bit of grain alcohol to do that kind of stuff. Okay, with your bed cleaned off, go ahead and clean off the back of your blade really well. Now you're going to take a pencil, and you're just going to mark up the whole back of your blade. And then you're going to reassemble it as if you're going to use it. So I will drop it down, I'll have it rest on the ground, uh, on the bench, right there. I've get, got it centered, so there is still some lateral room for me to move it if I need to, and then a few taps. It pretty much gets me a perfect setting whenever I do that one because those taps right there just move it, you know, that little bit that I need to. So, you can come over here. I'm now going to tap it sideways a little bit. Now I've got to remove the blade. 
we're going to look to see where the pencil marks transferred. Because any rub areas, if it's not, rub areas will give you a slight darker spot, like right there and right there. But if it is even pressure all the way across, the lead doesn't seem to come off. And to me, I know the, these black areas right here, that's from when I used to do this with carbon paper. But I've done this three or four times when I first built it. So this bed is pretty much mated with this blade. So I'm happy with my results. But normally what would happen is you would get, it, it would be something that looks like this. I mean, it'd be kind of a whole dark area right there that was a high spot where more pressure was. And that stuff you would take, you know, a little sandpaper and just kind of rub it off and then redo the test over and over and over. The other way of doing that one is with carbon paper. You put carbon paper in here, you reassemble it, you do the same lateral adjustment and where the carbon paper transfers over, that's where you mark off. So now just use that alcohol to remove your pencil marks and we'll move on. Now this next step, I'm gonna cheat a little bit, use a tool I have that you might not, but you'll figure out a way to do it. But I'm gonna wax the sole. Now in my videos, you see me all the time. I would take this piece of canning wax, uh, golf wax in the grocery stores, I had it, and I will wax the bottom of my soles. Uh, that's just to lubricate. But at this point in time, I'm gonna do a little bit deeper waxing to kind of melt a little bit of the wax in there, just a little bit. And we're talking, if I took some beeswax and just kind of crayoned over it and then buffed that in. And the buffing action is what I'm going to be doing because I have this pretty much permanently set up on this lathe for all the turning stuff we do. And for those of y'all that don't know, this is a beel buffing system, which basically consists of three uh, buffing wheels on a little arbor right there. You can do it with a little drill and buy those hand buffing wheels. I have it set up for wood turning, for you know polishing small turn boxes and stuff like that, where I have a polishing brown polishing compound over here, a little wax on this one, and this is just dry to buff it off. I'm not gonna be using the polishing one, but I have a little bit of beeswax on this one. It is little enough that I could touch this and not really feel it. I don't have much of a felt feel difference between these two, but it's just going to buff it in, and that buffing action kind of melts it past that first layer of grain into the wood. That's all it is. You can barely feel it, but it's just a little bit slicker. And then I will add heat with this buffing wheel. And the last thing I will do is this right here is now sharp. So I will just kind of blunt it a little bit so it doesn't damage itself in use, both sides. And now the plain blade is done. And can you see the slight recesses by way how the light reflects differently? So I guess the last thing to do would be to sharpen the blade because what would a tune-up be without a little sharpening, right? So we grab our stones. We take the blade, remove the chip breaker. Check the chip breaker for any burrs. It looks good. Lubrication for cleaning, now lubrication, and then I've got it hollow ground and it is pretty much, you know, not removing too much material, so I'm just going to stick with that. Come over, this is basically, I think it's like 220, 240, or wait, 400, 1000, 4000, 8000 equivalents. I'm just going to take a few strokes on the 1000 putting all my pressure on this side. Now 
on this side. And what I'm doing is adding the slightest of camber, not much. Come back over to the 4,000. Now all pressure over here. All pressure over here. Then a little pressure in the middle. And at this point, I'll feel for a burr. I have a slight burr all the way across, so I come over to the highest grit. This side. And then in the middle. Now when I'm putting pressure down, see where the bevel is right here? My fingers are on top. Most of the pressure is going on that back bevel and I'm just kind of moving forward until I can kind of feel it every now and then kissing. So as I'm doing these strokes, probably only two out of three strokes I'm actually touching the very top of the blade. And that's just how I maintain it somewhat flat. I don't round over that way. I've got the small burr all the way across, so I just remove the burr. You could do the ruler trick here if you wanted to. I just ha I'm just not this time. I guess I'll show it to you. You drop a thin ruler over on the side, and you just kind of, you're going to move it side to side. Stretch it all the way out. Don't go back and forth. Just kind of go side to side with it. And that'll kind of remove the burr and give you the slightest of back bevel across the back. Can you see that? Right there. See that? I don't do it all the time. I'm not 100% sure it's necessary. And then reassemble your chip breaker. Lots, there are lots of opinions on chip breakers. I've got a whole video on, my, on mine. I'll get it close, but I'm not getting it fully to the edge. So a lot of people get a lot closer than I do. My kind of thinking is we use solid blades for years, so really the chip breaker is just adding mass so it doesn't chatter as much. And there we go. Blades ready to rock and roll. Drop it in, center it, let it rest on my workbench, come back over, give it a few taps, check the thickness on the bottom. If you need to adjust it, you can tap and then secure all you want to get just the way you want. Secure your work. Wax the sole. And then let's have at it. This board isn't flat, so I'm just skimming the top right now, but let me work at it a little bit. Let me flatten it. And now we smooth. And a nice, easy shavings. But notice my technique. I'm getting to push down. But here's the thing. Let me get it last little bit smoothness. Okay. As I'm working it, you can see I've polished the outside with, with the wax and just the burnishing of the wood against the wood. But now that you've got it somewhat flat, this thing, as you move it, those little indentations, they kind of make a little bit of a, 
suction, see? It kind of stops itself. Whereas without that, it would just kind of keep on going. The brakes were pretty good. There's suction, when it's moving, it's sucking itself down a little bit. So it's just a little sensation that kind of can kind of tell you when you've got, not only got it really, really flat, because if there's any, if there's like a little ledge right here and a little air gets up underneath here, you don't have that sensation. Plus, as you do, if you're doing very long, large tabletops, that little bit just, it just makes the work a lot easier. You can kind of feel it wanting to stay on the wood. So not only is the, the body mechanics that I prefer with these kind of coffin style wood smoothers, but the feel you can generate by creating these little vacuum zones, it, it's a tactile sensation that you will never get with the metal ones unless you can somehow create that same recess. And it just makes these things a lot easier because you can kind of feel as you, you're working without having to remove your hand, rub your hand over it, get rid of shavings, that kind of stuff. It, it's just nicer, in my opinion, after all these years of using it. And for me, chances are I won't have to do that again for another five or six years based upon the past performance of this particular plane. Goes right there. Ready to use next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, picked up a few tricks. I know it's kind of esoteric when you start to get to this level of your craft where you're refining the tools because of the tactile sensation, but isn't that what makes it fun? <laughs> Y'all be safe, have fun, and remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, and share with others. One thing I don't like about these little twist things, they're a pain to get off.